Well, good day, everybody. My name is Alex Narasta, and I'm the Director of Immigration Studies here at the Cato Institute. Now, immigration policy has been one of the most widely discussed and controversial public policy issues in the United States since mid-2015, when candidate Donald Trump entered the Republican primary. Since then, we've seen unrelenting public debate over travel bans, child detentions, surges of asylum seekers along the border, and debates over merit-based immigration. Now, there are three broad sides in these debates. There are one, you know, those who want to cut legal immigration, two, those who want to increase legal immigration, and three, those who want to basically maintain current levels and keep it about the same. Now, oftentimes in this debate, those who want to cut legal immigration accuse those of who want to increase it of supporting, quote, open borders, unquote. Now, 99% of the time, that charge is unwarranted. Few Americans, and even fewer of the people probably who debate this issue frequently, actually support or like or enjoy or support the idea of open borders. So I thought it would be great to invite some actual supporters of Open Borders to Cato to discuss their wonderful new graphic nonfiction book, Open Borders, the Science and Ethics of Immigration. Now, author Brian Kaplan and illustrator Zach Wienersmith will discuss their book, its central ideas, and how they created such a fantastic graphic nonfiction book. Uh, following them, Dr. Dr. Tim Kaine will respond uh, critically because he opposes open borders, but he is pro-immigration. So he will offer a, uh, a wonderful, I think, counterpoint uh, to the book, and it, as well as his comments on the book itself. Now, after his presentation, uh, the authors and Tim will have sort of a short discussion, discuss the work in a more freewheeling manner, and then after that, I will moderate a short question and answer session where you all will be able to ask your questions. Um, afterwards, of course, we will have uh, hors d'oeuvres and beverages and book signings outside, so you can pester, not pester, I'm sorry, uh, maybe if you want to, you can pester, but you can ask the authors and everybody else about their position in their book. So with no further delay, let me introduce our speakers in the order in which they will present. Brian Kaplan is a professor of economics at George Mason University, blogger for ReconLog, and Cato adjunct scholar. I had to put that in there, of course. He's the author of the books, The Myth of the Rational Voter, Selfish Reasons to Have More Kids, The Case of it Against Education, and most recently, Open Borders, The Science and Ethics of Immigration, co-author with Zach Wienersmith. His next book will be uh, Poverty, Who to Blame? Brian has published in the New York Times, Washington Post, Wall Street Journal, Time, Newsweek, Atlantic, the American Economic Review, and that's big news for a lot of us who publish in academic journals, just to let you know, very high quality. Economic Journal, Journal of Law and Economics, Intelligence, and he's appeared on a whole host of television programs. According to his online bio, Brian is an openly nerdy man who loves role-playing games, graphic novels, and his awesome wife and four kids. As a last note, Brian taught me labor economics when I was an undergraduate. So my eternal thanks to you, Brian, for that wonderful education. Even though it's mostly signaling, I did learn a lot in your class, I promise. <laughs> To his left, uh, your right, Zach Wienersmith draws the daily comic strip Saturday morning breakfast cereal, and he co-wrote the New York Times best-selling pop science book, Soonish. He and his wife run the Festival of Bad Ad Hoc Hypotheses. <laughs> it's a celebration. <laughs> I crack up every time. A, uh, a celebration of original incorrect theories of science every year at MIT and Imperial College London. He hasn't yet been convinced to become a libertarian, but he admittedly wavers on this every April 15th, and he's gonna be at Cato for a few more hours, so there's still some time. <laughs> now, to my right, your left, is uh, Tim Kaine. Tim Kaine is the J.P. Conti Fellow in Immigration Studies at the Hoover Institution at Stanford University, where he specializes in economic growth, immigration, national security. Tim Kaine ran in a special election for an open seat in the U.S. Congress in Ohio as a pro-trade, pro-immigration conservative in early 2018. He served twice as a senior economist at the Joint Economic Committee of the US Congress. He co-founded two software firms in the late 1990s, and he served as an intelligence officer in the US Air Force with two tours of duty overseas. Kane's latest book is Total Volunteer Force, Lessons from the US Military on Leadership and Culture and Talent Management, which was published in July of 2017 by the Hoover Press. In 2013, he co-authored with Glenn Hubbard the book Balance, The Economics of Great Powers from Ancient Rome to Modern America. In 2012, Kane authored Bleeding Talent about leadership in the US military. 
Dozens of media, media outlets have cited Tim Kaine's research, including the Wall Street Journal, Washington Post, New York Times. He has provided commentary on every television station you can name, and even some you can't. Uh, Kaine earned a PhD in economics from UC San Diego. That's very good for those of you who don't know. It's fantastic, a great econometrics program. He is also a graduate of the US Air Force, and I want to say Tim is far and away the least nerdy man on this stage tonight, <laughs> obviously. So with no further ado, Brian Kaplan. All right. Uh, thank you so much. I am on top of the world today. Thank you so much, Alex. And of course, thanks so much, Zach. And wonderful to have Tim here. All right, uh, but I'm going to be fast. All right. Uh, so let me just start with a standard frame of immigration, uh, which Zach very nicely drew over here on the right. All right, so I think most Americans share the same basic picture of immigration, which goes like this. We admit the Einsteins and the Brins out of self-interest. You want Albert Einstein on your team. You want Sergey Brin on your team. You don't want to turn them away and have them go to Germany or Russia. Right? But otherwise, for all of the people that don't have that level of talent or anything in that ballpark, then immigration is a lot like foreign aid. It's a kind of international philanthropy where out of the goodness of your heart, you say, well, all right, you guys aren't really going to add that much to the team, but we'll let you in to be nice and you can join us, but we can't take too many of you. All right, now this brings us to the big conflict that you have in this worldview, which is, you know, first of all, how much charity can we afford? How many not great immigrants can we take? How many just regular human beings who don't create Google, who don't come up with a theory of relativity, how many people like that can we really afford because they're a burden upon us? And then, of course, there's the classic question, can't someone else do it? Can't some other country take these people? Why do we have to take these people? It's a pain in the neck taking these people. And then finally, when you want to feel a bit better about it all, you say, well, look, we need to take care of our own people first. We need to take care of our own people first. So sure, it may sound good to let in lots of immigrants, but we got problems here. We got people of our own nationality that need some help. And before we start worrying about helping people from other countries, we should get our own house in order. All right. Uh, then there is my alternative frame, which also wonderfully drawn here by Zach. So I wrote Open Borders really to challenge the standard way of looking about thing, look, look, looking at immigration. And again, I'd say that this isn't, you know, the, the picture I was giving you is not really a liberal or conservative picture. A lot of the debate there is really, well, how charitable do we want to be? And the liberal view is we should be a bit more charitable. Conservative view is we should be less charitable, focus on our own. But it's not so much that people disagree about the worldview as disagree about where the dial should be turned. All right. So I wrote Open Borders to challenge the standard frame. And what I say is this. Allowing immigration is not charity. Say there is a presumptive, a presumptive human right to rent from willing landlords and work for willing employers. And you, when you let in a person who plans on doing these things, you are not doing them a favor. You are rather just respecting the basic rights to trade with other individuals that are interested in doing so. Right? So sim simply not slashing the tires of your competitors is not a kind of charity. Right? Rather, it's something that you're obliged to do. Right? But secondly, right, we can easily afford to respect this right because labor mobility vastly, vastly enriches not just the immigrant, which almost everybody can see, but vastly increases the world. Why? Because. Because of the wealth of freedom. All right? So as you probably know, most people on Earth cannot live or work in the first world without government permission. Right? And this permission is almost impossible to obtain. All right. So it is not simply like you get in line and a few hours later you've got your US visa. Instead, it's one where, unless you happen to have a close family member or, again, you're Albert Einstein or Sergey Brin, then you are going to be waiting for years or decades or maybe your entire life. So I do stick my neck out and say that the analogy to Jim Crow is apt, where when you think about the way that African Americans were treated in the US South before the 1960s, it's one where Legally, they don't have the right to go and rent from any willing landlord. They legally don't have the right to take a job just because the employer is fine with it. Instead, it needs to be okay with the government, and it's really hard to get permission from a Jim Crow government to do these things. Uh, now, when you look at standard economic models of trade, they say that this regulation has enormous deadweight costs. 
right? Why? Because you're creating this huge price wedge. You are trapping talented people in low value places and preventing them from moving. So in standard economics says that when you go and move ice from Antarctica to the equator, you haven't just moved ice, you have created value because you've moved ice from a place where it is worthless to a place where people actually want it. Similarly, when you go and you move human talent from Haiti to the United States, you haven't just moved resources, you have actually enriched the world because that Haitian will be able to contribute much more to the global economy here than he would have back at home. Uh, when people have tried to estimate, well, how much are we being impoverished by these regulations? A very standard estimate is something like the regulations are reducing the wealth of the world by 50%. Right? A reduction in gross world product, a statistic that we very rarely discuss, but it is out there. Right? Usually we do gross national product, but this is a reduction in gross world product. And again, this is not the obvious point that when you move Haitians to the US, it raises their population and GDP goes up for that reason. Rather, it is the non-obvious story that if you look at the combined GDP of Haiti plus the US, or the sending country plus the receiving country, the combined GDP goes up because you move, move resources from a place where they produce little to a place where they produce a lot. All right, uh, so why not? Why not just let people in? Why not just say, you want to come? You want to work here? Great. Welcome aboard. Right? And you, say, you realize you do have to have a job here, right? Yeah, well, that's why I'm here. All right, so the best critics accept the standard presumption against government regulation of immigration and then try to surmount it. So rather than just denying this basic story, which comes straight out of the textbook, try to come up with some other offsetting factors. So there's a story of there's a fiscal burden of immigrants because we have a welfare state. The story of there's some kind of cultural harm of letting in people that have different values and backgrounds. Then finally, there's one that especially libertarians worry about, Political externalities, maybe people come here and vote to ruin things. All right, now the main hurdle for all of these arguments is that the estimated cost of immigration restrictions is huge, so the critics have to find comparably large benefits of the regulation. It's not enough to find there's just some gain, but rather you have to show that there is enormous gain. All right, so on protecting taxpayers. Uh, there we have Milton Friedman. Anyone here actually meet Fried Milton? I think David met him, right? So David Bowes, you must have met Milton at some point. Right? Yes. Anyway, so he was short. Uh, <laughs> right? <laughs> right? And, there, uh, and he also once gave an interview where he said, quote, you cannot simultaneously have free immigration and a welfare state, end quote. And this argument has been repeated by libertarians ever since. Right? So and again, it's based on a simple story. American welfare state pays more for idleness than many countries pay for work. And therefore, immigrants come to abuse the system. All right, this brings us to a key fact about the US welfare state, as well as actually every welfare state in which I'm, of which I'm aware, was that most of the money goes to the old, not the poor. So that is something to be focusing on. Well, what is the age, not rather the income? Now, the upshot is there's almost no serious researcher that finds a big negative fiscal effect of immigration for the US. So here I write heavily on the National Academy of Science estimates of net present value using CBO, long-term budget outlook. Right, and here are the basic numbers that come in this very otherwise standard vanilla report from the government. Current average net present value of immigrants of plus $58,000. So that's saying if you take all the, the taxes immigrants are going to be paying, as well as that of their subsequent dynasty, subtract out the cost of the services, actually US taxpayers are making money off of the deal. Look at people with high school only. You know, still making plus 49,000. Less than high school is the one group where we're getting a negative estimate of negative 117,000 over a whole lifetime. And then if we look at high school, only high school, but you're also young. Even there, we're getting plus 229,000. And less than high school plus young, even that's positive. So really, you need to be looking at low education, elderly immigrants to find the ones where Milton's concern even begins to hold water. And then, as I say in the book, the question is, if large majority of immigrants do pull their own weight, do you really want to make an exception to the principle of free migration for a small group that uh, otherwise? Now, of course, it is really hard to convince people about numbers in, a, in this kind of format. So let's say what I'm telling you is not absurd, because remember, a lot of government spending is non-rival. Immigrants help spread the cost of national defense, debt service, and so on. Right? So if we, had a, if we had a huge baby boom, no sensible person would say, we need to buy more nuclear weapons to defend the babies. Right? You can offend just, we can offend 100 million more babies with whatever we got, whatever you've used on foreign policy. All right. Then we got protecting American culture. So here you have Socrates. This panel will actually read. Yes. Admitting immigrants who don't share our illustrious cultural heritage is extremely naive. If you keep tolerating and respecting human rights of people from countries that practice neither, you can kiss the Enlightenment goodbye. All right, so I've heard this many times. 
Another complaint, so immigrants are destroying American culture. You know, they won't fit English, uh, they, won't, uh, they don't learn English, they don't fit in, so on. Now, for the things that you can easily measure, like language acquisition, this one is just demonstrably wrong. It's like over 90% of second generation Mexicans speak fluent English. Uh, there is a more general critique saying, look, the problem with people like Brian is they believe in magic dirt. They think that you can go and take an Afghan goat, par goat farmer, para-drop him into the US, and when he touches the ground, he transforms. All right, and I said, no, I don't actually believe in magic dirt. <laughs> Right? What I do believe in is magic culture. What I say is that you can take someone from even the most backward and authoritarian country and you, he can acclimate and, and acculturate enough to become a productive member of society and then his kids grow up here and they acclimate and acculturate almost totally. All right. And then on top of this, uh, there is a common view, look, you know, acculturation used to work, assimilation used to work, but it doesn't anymore. And here I'll say, look, there are some ways in which people have less reason to assimilate than they used to, like we have better communication, better transportation, so you can keep in contact with the old country for, uh, more easily. But at the same time, there's also a big change in how much immigrants know about the country they're going to. So in 1900, a Sicilian immigrant probably has never heard English spoken in his life. He farms with a donkey up in the mountains of Sicily, and he shows up at Ellis Island. He's never seen electricity. Right? Back in those days, for many people, they were much more culturally distant than the people in the country they're going to, whereas right now you've got 1.3 billion fluent, speak fluent speakers of English, a lot of them in Sicily. Right? And, you know, right? and this is because American culture especially has spread so far around the world that there are many people who've never set foot here who are already intellectually and in their own minds a part of the culture. All right, and then there is, of course, protecting American liberty. All right, so this is the most popular objection of the Friends of Freedom, and it's one that I have a lot of sympathy for. It says, look, immigrants come from status countries, and they're going to eagerly vote to, our, to ruin our country as well. Probably not because they show up and said, you know what I want to do here? Ruin this. <laughs> Rather, what they say is, you know what's wrong with this? I love this country. It's so great, except for it doesn't have the policies that my home country had. It's like, you think that maybe the reason why this country is different from your own country is that it doesn't have the policies that your own country had? Maybe. All right, so this is where, you know, in outline, you're saying a master plan, so like flee hellhole of birth, then get first world citizenship, then vote for the hellhole party, and then repeat, I guess, when you've ruined your new country, move on to another one, All right? Um, and what I say, like, you know, so this sounds like a silly, uh, a silly plan, but you realize, look, even people who hate freedom still usually love money. Right? There's a lot more enemies of freedom than enemy enemies of money. Right? <laughs> money, almost everyone can, can agree on that and would like to have some for themselves and like to have a nice high standard of living. Right? And you say, well, there's a connection between the freedom and the standard of living. Well, that is true over the long run, but as you probably know, there's a lot of people who can live in the freest, richest countries in the world and yet still say the two things ain't got nothing to do with each other. Right? And if you're Cato, you probably disagree. Anyway, so what I say here is there is a kernel of truth but still the problem is greatly overstated. All right, so when you go and look at the data on public opinion of natives versus non-natives, what you will see is that non-natives are more socially conservative and they are more economically liberal than natives. Right? But the difference is marginal. So we're talking about a difference that you can measure with statistics, but it's not one that you would, even gen that you would be likely to notice if you just talk to, to a lot of people. You need to actually get out the microscope of social science to even see the difference. Right? Well, you know, except for the, for the least educated where the differences are larger. Right? Secondly, uh, non-natives have low turnout, and this is especially true for the least educated. So the least educated are, in fact, notably more socially conservative and more economically liberal than the general U.S. population. You know, in fact, if they were not immigrants, they would make good Trump voters All right? so, uh, in terms of their views. All right, uh, but in any case, they are highly unlikely to vote. So in the book, I think you have about, out of uh, foreign-born high school dropouts who are legally eligible to vote in presidential elections, which is when turnout is high, highest, only about 25% vote. And then a final point is that there's quite a bit of research saying that immigrants reduce native support for the welfare state because people resent helping out groups. So it is striking that the countries that historically have had the very largest welfare states have been very ethnically homogeneous. So Scandinavia back when almost everyone there was blonde, and many people wondered, could it be that there's a causal connection? And after coming away, usual view is that there is. 
right? Because if you're in Denmark when everyone is blonde and someone says, you know, maybe there's some people that are abusing the system, a reaction is, well, surely you're not suggesting a fellow, a blonde person would abuse the system uh, that we created so blonde people can all live happily here? And uh, no, of course not, that would be crazy. All right, so that seemed to be the attitude in Denmark back in the old days, but now that there are immigrants there, like maybe they would abuse the system. And it tends not, of course, to destroy the welfare state, it's still going strong in Denmark, but to tone it down. And then similarly, as I think Alex has pointed out, you know, when was the U.S. welfare state going strongest? It was when the foreign-born share of the U.S. population was at its absolute minimum in the 1960s, right? Maybe just a coincidence, but it does fit with this idea that people feel like they are a single united whole when they are very similar to each other, and that makes them very supportive of having big government to take care of everybody. Uh, now, you may say, isn't that a good thing? And my view is, no, it's not a good thing, right? Because it is an exaggerated sense of, of duty to total strangers, and a free society depends upon people realizing, well, we are, we are not actually a family, right? We are people that are getting along and working along, alongside each other, but think about this. How free would you be if your parents could decide what you were free to do? Right? They would probably have a lot of restrictions on you because they love you too much. They don't want you taking chances and doing things they disapprove of, and that is a big problem for a free society if people feel too much like we are all one family needing to make a common decision. All right, so in any case, so say immigrants reduce native support for the welfare state because people resent helping out groups, which of course, if you are a fan of the welfare state and immigration, then is a tension. But on the other hand, if you are, if you are a fan of immigration but skeptical of the welfare state, it is a case where you are killing two birds with one stone, or rather moderately constraining two birds with one stone anyway. All right, so in short, uh, here I'm on the Berlin Wall, and yes, open borders will not destroy our freedom. It's gonna bring freedom to all mankind. You know, if we, if we all want it, and if every child in the country gets a copy of the book. So thank you. <laughs>I figured most people wanted to talk about immigration tonight, not comic books, so I'm just going to try to make some brief comments. But I thought maybe some of the people here would be people who are interested in this idea of using comic books to push their agenda on an unsuspecting populace. Um, and one of the nice things about working on graphic nonfiction is that most people don't know it's a genre, so we've been getting credit for inventing the genre. Uh, <laughs> But actually, it's been around for a long time. In fact, these the, the sort of precursors to the modern idea of comics are just all editorial comics. That's what comics were before the 20th century. And even within, um, within the 20th century, one of the most important civil rights comics uh, was one made in 1957 uh, telling the, the story of Rosa Parks and Martin Luther King. It actually influenced John Lewis. If you read the March series, you know, it influenced John Lewis to, to do a comic book all these years later. So actually people have been doing this for a long time, but apparently if you do it, you'll get credit for the genre. Um, so I encourage you to get into that. Um, <laughs> um, so I just want to talk about comics a little bit, uh, for those of you who are interested in it, because there are, without naming names, there are a number of graphic novels, and Brian has introduced me to some of them, by economists that are really lousy. Um, <laughs> And I, I think fundamentally what's going on is they're just people who don't appreciate like the genre or what it can do. They don't like know what kind of car they're driving. They just think they're doing an essay and they're gonna be pictures and stuff. Um, so I guess um, I just wanted to talk about what, what comics are. There are a lot of great books on this topic, but very quickly, a way to think about comics is just they're kind of somewhere in between movies and books. The nice thing about a book is you sit down with it, you're alone, you're reading it to yourself, like the, the author is inhabiting your brain. Um, and, and so you get this really close, intimate experience the nice thing about movies, though, is you're a voyeur. You're looking from the outside, so the, the person making the movie can really control your experience. Uh, you know this if you've ever seen like a lousy documentary where they present the opposition and there's like spooky music. Um, I think we'll do that with Tim tonight, maybe. Um, uh, <laughs> but, um, uh, but so comics kind of allow you to do a little of both, right? So someone's sitting with your comic book and they're reading it and they're alone and they're doing the voices so they feel like you're there with them, but you're also really controlling the picture they get. And that's important, especially for a policy book. Because so like, for example, we have a section here that, uh, we have a couple sections that talk about topics that are just sort of not polite topics to talk about. So, you know, one concern people are opposed to immigrate, one concern by people who are opposed to immigration is 
that people from other countries aren't as intelligent as, as we are based on like data from test scores. And this is, you know, even to drag this out, like I feel awkward saying it to you right now, uh, but we wanted to like haul it up and deal with it and try to refute it. Um, and so what you can do is I can draw Brian, uh, not just sort of saying, hey, we're gonna talk about this, but sort of looking uncomfortable too. It's almost like the punctuation on the sentence is Brian's face being like, sorry, we're gonna talk about this. Um, and so there's, there's a lot of value in comics that you can, you, can, you can control tone really, really well, and you can still maintain that intimacy uh, with your audience. Um, so I, I just want to talk about briefly, if any of you are thinking about getting into doing what we did, uh, just, just some advice. Uh, if you are someone looking to write in the genre, be more like Brian. Brian has read every comic book ever. All of them. Um, I actually, like, while we were doing this, I was like, I'll help out Brian. I'm going to recommend some comics. He had literally read every single comic I ever re recommended. Sometimes he was like, I have a blown up photo from that one on my wall right now. I'm looking at it. Uh, I'm not joking, by the way. That's all literally true. Um, so, like, do your homework, right? You know, if you, if you want to work in comics, it's its own medium. It's not just an essay with pictures. It's not just a book with pictures. It's its own thing. It has its own tricks. Um, if you're someone who wants to draw comics, and I'll, uh, in a minute I'm going to try live drawing on my tablet to point out one of these things, there are a lot of sort of invisible skills in cartooning that really just require practice to get. Just because you can draw well doesn't make you a good cartoonist. There's a lot of controlling how time moves, how the, audio, how the reader looks around the page, trying to make them move in a natural way through the comic. Um, they're, they're all all sorts of little tiny skills, and it, it's really frustrating. Some of the, these, these comics where you pair an economist with an artist, it's like they pick someone with no cartooning experience. They happen to know some like graduate student with some skill in art and just said, you can make comics, right? Um, it's a real thing. Uh, so, so basically, uh, draw comics first. Don't, don't uh, you know, do, you need to get the practice of it. Do it, do it for a while. Uh, try to, try to draw, a, draw a graphic novel yourself and you'll, you'll start developing these weird skills. Um, and, uh, uh, well, that, that's, that's really my practical advice. So I wanted to show off, just, just in case you don't believe me about these invisible skills, I want to try, I don't know if this is going to work, um, uh, using the, uh, my tablet over here to, to show you one of the really weird things um, that goes into comics. Um, can, I, can I try this? With Let's see if it works. Oh, gosh. Maybe. Pregnant pause. Oh, Windows wants to update. <laughs> Another time. Wait, no, no, no. <laughs> Another time, ever. Okay, so uh, this is going to be a little tricky because the, 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 the device is acting a little screwy, but I'm going to do my best here. Oh, it's actually working. Weird. Okay, so this is Brian Kaplan. Uh, he looks like that. Um, <laughs> and so one of the skills in cartooning that's remarkably tough is caricature. Uh, and so, you know, I was trying to draw Brian. You know, you're doing some initial, initial sketches for what he should look like. Is my mic on? Is this good? Okay, great. Um, and so I kept doing it, it just kept coming out wrong, and I couldn't figure out what was going on. And I'm gonna show you something really weird. So I'm actually just going to take my pen here in red. Is this gonna work? Hey, cool. I'm just gonna trace actual Brian. What does actual Brian look like? Um, are you already noticing that it doesn't look like Brian? Like what I'm doing, <laughs> isn't that weird? I'm, I'm, I'm really literally just tracing him. I'm just tracing him, and if you don't believe it, uh, I'm just gonna do the neck there and the suit maybe, just real quick. Now, if I erase this, Oh, you got eyes. I forget your eyes. <laughs> I'm just gonna do this. So no, I'm I'm not I'm not lying. I'm I'm just actually tracing Brian. Um, oops. And you see, it's gonna come out looking way better than actual Brian. Uh, <laughs> uh, I was, should have a collar here. I'm sorry. Um, and so I'll tell you what I eventually figured out. So it was really, I couldn't figure out what was going on. I'm tracing actual Brian and it doesn't look like Brian. I don't usually do caricature like this. And what I finally figured out is that actual Brian is a giant nerd and giant nerds don't usually have these really well-defined chins. Um, <laughs> but you'll see, so there's another universe where Brian is like a superhero or something. He actually has this real, this is, this is uh, what his wife sees, I suspect. This is what Brian, <laughs> um, uh, but so in real life, so I ended up having, I don't know if I can erase, okay, great. So I ended up having to draw him something like, and I haven't done this in a while, I'm a little out of practice, but um, something like this. I really wimped out his chin a lot. Um, <laughs> And the reason is, I, and I hope you see this, like people who know Brian, this looks a lot more like Brian. Um, uh, and I think what, what, what's going on there is, <laughs> this is way funnier than I thought it would be. Um, what's going on is, 
uh, when you get a good caricature is not just capturing what someone looks like, it's how they feel. Uh, it's, it's their body language. And Brian is just a big giant nerd who likes Dungeons and Dragons and comic <laughs> books and all that. And so weirdly, this one that is less accurate looks much more Brian-like. And it's not just age, I could make him look older. I could add some like, yeah, okay, uh, oh, I lost my feet. That's what I was just doodling. Um, but anyways, that's my point. There are all these invisible skills you really have to work on if you're gonna get it right. I actually had the same thing with drawing Alex in there. You know, you know what really did it with you is it was the, the big beautiful eyes that really <laughs> brought it all together. Um, Thank you, Zach. Yeah. <laughs> um, I don't remember how I was going to end this, but 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 <laughs> I mean, I should, I'm going to go back to the podium. Um, uh, um, oh, I was just going to like encourage young people working on this to actually properly do their homework. Be like Brian. Brian did it right. Uh, thank you. My, yeah, good. So I, I put the, uh, the book for these two up here. I want to say, first of all, um, thanks, Alex, for having me. Great to, to represent a little bit of a different point of view. You all maybe have figured this out, but we're all pretty close friends. Um, Al, uh, Brian and I met through comics, um, gosh, 15 years ago maybe, and um, have been friends with the Kaplan family, so great to see you here in Valley. I'm going to try to keep you excited this whole talk. Um, <laughs> But, so I love Brian like a brother, but like a brother, he's often wrong, and I'm just going to try to, <laughs> I'll try to point some of that out. So I have a, a talk about this wonderful book, and I'm going to start by saying um, I'm also a pro-immigration conservative. Well, I don't know if we can call Brian a conservative, but uh, I tend to align with the Republican Party and uh, come from a Democratic family um, and have really wanted to push our country to be more open to immigration. And that's why I think Brian is the most dangerous man in America, because he's pushing what he says is the Overton window, sort of a technical conversation that's included in the book. Uh, goes meta, and I love it. But I worry about there being a backlash. Like, if people think that what we're advocating for when we believe immigration is good is open borders, and these guys put it in the title, um, that uh, there'll be a backlash, and it can set us back. So. Um, I think I have a good, honest debate about that. But when I look back in history and think about who the great presidents are, from George Washington to Abe Lincoln, um, Teddy Roosevelt, Lyndon Johnson, they tended to be the ones that were pushing for greater immigration. And I like to s start my talks with this quote, and it's just one of many from George Washington, where he had a vision that America would be, and this is a direct quote, an asylum to the world. And I just can't imagine any Democratic candidate saying that today. But I think, Brian and Zach, you guys sell yourselves short a little bit with the framing of this book. And Brian started out with his frame is, let's base this push for greater immigration on rights. I don't think that's practical. I think that will lead to the backlash. And I think you guys sell yourselves short that the original frame of, will it make the country stronger, is where we're going to win or lose this argument. And I want us to win it. But um, so. Let me see if this, does this work? Yeah, okay. So I've had a particular um, perspective why immigration is good, and then I'm going to talk a little bit about this and then delve into some comments directly on the book. Um, immigrants put the power in superpower. And just as a couple examples, during the Civil War, there were actually more immigrants in 10 square miles of Manhattan, the lower um, 10 square miles, than there were in the entire Confederacy. And that's, you know, without immigration, you don't win or the North doesn't win the Civil War, and I think it's good that the North did. Um, and, and the same can be made, that case can be made in World War II. In fact, if you go back in history to um, 1816, there was a candidate for president named Rufus King who wanted to restrict immigration because he wanted to stop the Irish from coming in. And if he'd won, and he didn't, um, we might have lived in that country. And if you, if you project that forward, well, if once you stop the Irish, the Catholics from coming in. You don't get Italian Catholics coming in. You don't get Jews from Eastern Europe coming in. You don't get the modern Asian wave that we see happening now. And Alex, you know this. Uh, the notion that Mexicans are, are flooding the country, uh, that's so 1990s, right? We're now in a world where it's, it's Indians and Chinese. And we both think that's great. But um, if Rufus King had been successful, in saying the Irish are going to ruin our culture, which we did. Um, 
Irish Americans. So, uh, you know, once you lowered the bar for the Irish, then, you know, all bets are off. But it turns out things, we became the richest country in the world. And so it's in America's interest from a national security perspective to want robust immigration. Then you talk about bravery. It's not just that they're here populating, making babies, and we've got a bigger population. The fact that in World War II, if Rufus King had been elected, there would have been a population of about 70 million Americans instead of, I think it's around 140 million at the time. Nazi Germany had 71 million people. So there's no way you win in Europe and maybe, uh, certainly not in Europe and in the Pacific, but you may not even win in Europe World War II without having that population. But immigrants served in outsized, disproportionately high numbers. They won medals in disproportionately high numbers. So brawn, bravery, and then brains, Brian alluded to, it's not just the Einsteins. There have been recent Nobel Prize ceremonies when Americans win a huge amount of the Nobel Prizes, especially in the hard sciences, and every recipient who's an American citizen was born in another country and immigrated here. So it's this tremendous story about where our national security comes from, and then entrepreneurial growth as well um, that Brian's talked about. Just to give a picture to the fact we're having this conversation and why it's so acute, this is the percentage of immigrants in every state as a proportion of their labor force. And the peak country back in 1980 was about 15%. Now look at the change decade by decade ever since. This is the surge, right? So it's above 25%, about 27 in California. Back here, there were 17 states that had fewer than 2% of their labor force was foreign born. And today, there's only one state where fewer than 2% are foreign born. That's, I think, West Virginia. Um, but what's been the impact on GDP per capita? Now, Brian and Zach have this great discussion of the arithmetic fallacy that when people come in and you see average income per capita get lower, well, look, you've got, for all the, if, if I can make fun of the liberals, the Democrats, who say inequality is our number one concern, well, there's an easy fix to inequality. Just stop bringing in poor people, right? There are so many poor immigrants that come in. I think they're wrong. I don't think inequality is our greatest problem. But, you know, this notion that there's a lowering of GDP per capita, well, here's a chart they have in the book, but with a little bit more detail. Here's GDP per capita in the U.S flooded with lots of lower income, lower skill migrants, and yet GDP per capita in the US has continued to surge. In 1980, remember those numbers? It was about $30,000 per person in the US. By 2017, it's closer to 57, 58,000 per person. You take out the arithmetic fallacy, and for the native born, that number's even higher. So anyone who says that immigrants are work, work, weakening the country, you know, the, the facts just aren't on their side. But then the question is, well, okay, a million a year. I'd go to two million or three million. I mean, if I were running for president, I would, I would make this tongue-in-cheek joke. I'm going to make sure there isn't more immigrants coming in than 1% of our population every year. I'm going to stop it right there because, <laughs> because it's not even a third of a percent right now, right? So, um, but I do, I, I do worry that if when we use this you know, word open borders, there'll be a backlash. Um, and then the last point is I realized... If you ever want to have a conversation and turn a conservative's ear a little bit, ask them if they've seen Band of Brothers. And the, the, the all-American GIs who volunteered for Easy Company, for the paratroops, these are real people. This isn't a work of fiction. It was an HBO miniseries special after it was this Stephen Ambrose book. Perkani, Luz, Garnier, Liebgott, Soboleski, Spears, every one of those names is a second generation immigrant, except for Spears. Spears came from Scotland, he was first generation. And guy, I talked to George Luz's son, because Luz passed away. Um, he didn't speak English until he went to first grade. Um, the church, this Portuguese American family, the church that still stands today up in the Northeast, I think it's in Connecticut, I Google mapped it. it just, his, his family, Portuguese immigrants, reserved the plot of land, built that church. There's still a Portuguese flag on one side and an American flag on the other. It is an all-American group of GIs, and they came from uh, migrant parents. So I think it's a great heroic story. It makes us stronger. I would stick to that first frame. Now let's get into some of the criticisms. Um, and, and maybe these aren't all criticisms. They're things that I really liked and I wanted to highlight and congratulate you guys on. Uh, chapter 2. You talked about trillion dollar bills and 
that the, um, Brian mentioned the arithmetic fallacy. They use a supply and demand chart, which I think is excellent. Most people, their frame is immigrants are going to flood the labor supply, wages are going to go down. Why haven't they, though? Like, if look at the empirical data, it hasn't happened. And they make this excellent point, simple supply and demand curve. Well, you know what? Immigrants tend to eat. And they also go to grocery stores so they can eat. And they buy stuff from grocery stores. They buy clothes. So they add to the demand side that feeds back into needing more goods, not just the supply side. So if you use general equilibrium models, you don't get the negative effect. I love that part. I loved how serious this book is. It's not just for kids. Um, it's, it's for people that want to learn, and I learned from it. Um, chapter three, though, there was a harumph from Milton Friedman. I really wish, I loved how you guys did it. It's brazen um, to bring Milton Friedman in and be lecturing him. But, um, and I did meet Uncle Milty, as we called him, uh, when I was a young man. I don't know how we would have answered it. It's one of the great mysteries that, that we've talked about. We're not sure what exactly... The point was, was he saying you need to lower the welfare state because that proposes a threat? Or is he saying block immigrants? I, I've, the tea leaves I've read on, on his statement are, um, are a little obscure. Um, but I think there is a, a concern, and I don't think we can hand wave it away. And these guys take the, the debate seriously. Um, chapter four, I thought, was one of the best treatments of terrorism. I think you have a couple pie charts. Like If you look at all the murders that happen in the US, and what percent of them are from terrorism? You know, we shouldn't make an analogy to bathtubs, the bathtub fallacy. Let's make an analogy to, to all the other murders that are out there. And right here is Alex Narasta, who's done the best analysis on this. And it's less than 1% of murders are due to terrorism. OK, well, but we're, they're still making another fallacy when people link terrorism with immigration. Like, what percent of the terrorism deaths, um, and I think 9-11 is an outlier. But fewer than 1% of those are immigration related. So you know, there's this overblown fear. And I think these guys deal with it very forthrightly and, and brilliantly. Um, chapter five, Brian already ran over this, but I just had to call it out, the hellhole party. It was my favorite part of the book. I laughed out loud. Uh, if it hasn't been founded already, we're going to set up a new super PAC tomorrow um, and see how much support we get from immigrants. Um, <laughs> No, but Brian did have a line in there. So this is why the book really deserves more recognition, um, because he says the things that he worries about. It's, it's making a strong claim, but Brian says, there's a quote, I'm honestly troubled. You don't get a lot of people in public policy debates that will say, here's why I may be wrong. He's honestly troubled that low-skill views are... are um, uh, on some issues don't align with uh, what we might think are American values or Enlightenment values. I'm troubled by it too. I, I'm, I'm trying to read more about this literature, so it's a follow-up conversation I want to have, and maybe we'll get to some of it in Q&A. But the notion that people will come from non-democratic societies and will prefer authoritarian leaders, th that notion is that sort of America's this fixed pie, that we have these democratic values, right, and will Will foreign-born people assimilate? I've started to wonder, Alex, are, are native-born people going to assimilate? Because <laughs> I worry about those values shifting, right? Do people think we should throw out the Electoral College and we should you know, get rid of the free press or Second Amendment rights? I mean, my god, this, people don't seem to remember, even when they be maybe seven generations back, what our core values are. But I would also say, were those values here in the first place? Like, somehow, the people that immigrated here came from authoritarian societies and founded um, this, this country. So I think it's a f the f notion that there's a hellhole party um, is fallacious in its origins. I love the magic soil line in chapter five. You already brought it up. And then I'm going to bring up this. So this is my final critique, and I'll sit down. Um, chapter six talks about keyhole solutions. And what that means is it used to be when you saw something bad, you would amputate it. But modern surgery, you can do these micro incisions, like a keyhole, and you can go in and, and fix something in someone's knee or in their stomach. And can't we do that with policy? It's a brilliant framing device. And one of the keyhole solutions, for, for example, is let's just, if you're worried that immigrants are going to be a burden on the economy, and I have, to, I have to make an aside here. Critics of immigration say that immigrants are stealing jobs, but then they also say they're using a lot of welfare. I'm like, well, which is it, man? Because you can't, you can't. Anyway, um, you know, is their unemployment rate 
un unemployment rate higher than the native born or is it lower? Because either one's a problem, so just pick one. You can't get both. Um, but Brian says there are these keyhole solutions. If you worry that they're taking tax money, tax them higher. That's not fair, Brian, right? And he's like, it's not fair, but it's more fair than just blocking them out, which is this brute force solution. I think it's a brilliant framing device. I also think it's totally unrealistic. That's the problem. How can you get these things to really pass? Um, because I don't think the Democrats would get behind some of these keyhole solutions, and I don't think Republicans will get behind them either. So we are sort of stuck in this tug of war, more or less, and, and I, don't know, I don't know the answer to it. Now, I did a poll with uh, David Brady, who's a famous pollster in YouGov, back in 2017. And this is the, the hard charge. Um, we asked this question, allowing, I'm sorry, do you agree or disagree that the following reforms would be good for US immigration policy? And then we asked for about 15 different types of policies. Do you agree or disagree that the following reform would be good for immigration policy? And the one policy suggestion that performed worse among 1,000 US adults was open borders. 7% strongly agreed that it would be good. 25% agreed. Compared to, do you think you should make English the official language? 44% agreed strongly. 34% agreed lightly. I was surprised. How about merit-based immigration? 13% agreed, 55% agreed less strongly. And then how about just giving legal status? Now there's a keyhole solution we might agree on. Instead of granting a pathway to citizenship, what about just granting legal status to illegal immigrants? And net-net, it was 62% agreed or strongly agreed with that one. So open borders doesn't have support, and I'm afraid if we push it, Brian, Zach, we're gonna get backlash but I'm not gonna have time to write a whole graphic novel about it, so we're gonna to have to solve it right now. <laughs> All right, thanks a lot, guys. Well, now begins the period of the book talk where I'm gonna give Brian and Zach a couple minutes to respond to Tim, and then Tim will go back and forth, and we'll try to have a, a freewheeling conversation for a few minutes before we do the Q&A. So, uh, Brian. Right. So I guess the main point that, that Tim is making is that by pushing too hard, you are risking making things worse, or at least making the best the enemy of the good. My main reaction there is, it almost sounds like Tim doesn't even really disagree with me. He's just saying, well, yeah, I mean, you're probably right, but those people out there are going to get really angry if we tell them that, so let's not tell them. And you know, could be right. I mean, so since we both have been academic types, there is a norm of just saying what's true and then figuring out how to sell it rather than figuring out what you can sell and then deciding what you're going to say. And I think that there is a lot to be said for first figuring out what's true and then figuring out how you can sell it if you can. So, I mean, when you go through Tim's slides, I don't see any slide that actually says that I'm wrong. <laughs> mm. I mean, you may say, yeah, well, of course not, because Tim's on the panel. But, uh, but you know, so, you know, like, I, I know, you know, Tim has explained these views. He has a very good book on this where he's presenting his views. But, you know, in reading the book, I'd still say, all right, so, yeah, it was really great that the U.S. had all those immigrants, and it was crucial for winning the Civil War, World War I, World War II. And it was not restricted immigration that did it. It was actually open borders that were crucial for the Civil War and World War I anyway. And for World War II, of course, most of that is just the aftermath of the open borders era because of demographics, it takes a while to get another generation. And even if you go through Tim's other arguments, it doesn't seem like he's really got any actual objection when he talks about how we've let in a lot of immigrants and per capita living standards are better than ever for natives. Yeah, so why not even more? Why not vastly more? And so now then there's the question, right? So, but yeah, but that doesn't really say whether or not he's right about who can be persuaded of what. Here's what I think. Given how there's almost no one in the entire country defending open borders, we don't really know whether we can persuade people. Why don't we try? Mm -hmm. <laughs> right, and especially if we can start with knowledgeable, smart, good-hearted people like Tim, right? And if he's persuaded, then, wow, well, we got him on board, right? And, you know, Air Force and, like, clean cut, like, who can do, <laughs> who can be, who can really not like Tim? I mean, I can see not liking me, but Tim... <laughs> Like, like, he's this great spokesman. And even like, you know, there actually is a panel in the book where I'm dressed up like Uncle Sam, except I've got an open borders hat, and I say, I want you to figure out how to sell my ideas because I don't really know how to sell my ideas, but hopefully some reader out there does. Maybe Tim is that guy. 
Right. So that's uh, that is my main reaction to this. Uh, so you know, notice like that Washington quote. There's nothing in that Washington quote that suggests anything other than support for full open borders. He doesn't there say, well, yes, we welcome like a good number of people and then the rest, I don't know, let's not push this too far, <laughs> right? Instead, he just says, we welcome all. Come, come to our great federalist experiment here, right? Uh, now, it's true that I didn't talk that much about national defense, partly because it's itself a controversial topic, and when I'm trying to convince something of something controversial, I don't like to go and say, you know what, let me first persuade you of a bunch of other controversial things, and then you'll go and agree with me on this further controversial thing. I try to do containment of the argument, but I will say that, I mean, just by talking about you know, non-rival goods where the cost doesn't depend on population, and implicitly that is actually national offense, and I do have me in a Dukakis hat riding a tank, so going to Zach's point about how uh, the real me versus the, appear, uh, the apparent me. So, yeah, so, I mean, over, overall, and, you know, of course, Tim and I, not only do we have a lot of common ground, but ultimately I think we have almost nothing else other than the question of what do we tell other people? And that's where I'd say, well, let's get totally clear on what we think, and then let's do marketing. Mm. So um, I was thinking when I came tonight, we're at the Cato Institute, and Cato famously in Roman history, the, the, the man was um, a, a rival of Caesar's. I don't know what Cato thought about immigration. Maybe Alex can illuminate us, but I know what Caesar thought about immigration. Julius Caesar... We, most of you know that Julius Caesar was knifed to death in the Senate, right? You guys, <laughs> but do you know one of the main reasons he was knifed to death by the by these elites, the senators were furious with him because he was kind of a populist. But one of the things that made Caesar mad is he'd spent a lot of his life abroad in Gaul, and there were Roman subjects that were not allowed to be citizens, and he thought that was wrong. He had a national security perspective like I do, and he thought Rome would be much stronger and fair and more just if these people that had been born under the Roman flag, or the standard, um, should be given citizenship. So he granted it. And the senators were furious that non-Italians, non-Romans were being counted as Romans. It's one of the reasons he was knifed to death. It's called a backlash. So yeah, I worry. <laughs> Brian, I worry about it, and maybe it's appropriate here at Cato. Now listen, I'm not just making fun, although that is kind of funny. Um, and Cato might have been one of the guys that didn't like immigration, which would be very ironic. There's been a backlash in our history before, right? After World War I um, and the plague, uh, the influenza epidemic, uh, there was a much higher level of immigration back then. Um, if, if you look at the numbers of, of inflows of migrants coming over from 1890, 1900, 1910, 1920, and people got scared, and they passed these reforms. It started really in 1921, but then it was enhanced in 1924. So, like, you'll say, look, let's just not have another world war. There won't be a backlash. The, the, part of the reason I wanted to talk about that World War II generation being second-generation immigrants because there weren't a lot of young first-generation immigrants. When Franklin Delano Roosevelt was president, of all the presidents we've had, which one presided over the lowest amount per capita of immigrants? It's FDR. It's not even close. It's, it's really close to zero. It's like point zero something. Um, we've seen a backlash before. It lasted from 21 to 1965. And... It can happen, it's happened before, and that's why I worry. It's not an idle thing I worry about. I am very pro-immigration, but I am also concerned about pushing too far, using rhetoric that doesn't respect the concerns that there are these negative consequences. But I did want to tip my hat because the best arguments against Brian and Zach's book are in Brian and Zach's book. They did a great job. Yeah, can I just say you know, one thing about backlash? So there's two versions of backlash. One of them is you push too hard and you get less than if you would ask for less. That's the kind of backlash that worries me, right? So it's like, all right, so if you ask your parents for too much candy, you might get no candy at all. Ask them for a moderate amount, and then you get some. Very reasonable argument. On the other hand, there's the kind of backlash where you ask for a lot, and you don't get it all, because people don't want to give it to you, but if you ask for less, you would have gotten even less. All right, so there's the kind where you don't get all you ask for, but the more you push for, the more you get. And as to what we have actually seen is quite unclear. So, for example, you know, would we have actually seen less restriction of immigration in the 1920s if it had been restricted 10 years earlier? 
I really don't know, but it seems implausible that you could have forestalled the later restrictions by just prematurely or preemptively restricting it first. That sounds like Unlike, this just sounds unlikely. It seems like if you restrict it, be restrict it previously, then then the cause of restriction gets momentum, and then it goes even further. So in other words, you know, like I'm totally willing to say that the more immigration you have, the more resistance you have. And if you had none, then people would probably stop complaining about it. But I don't think we should be minimizing complaining. We should be maximizing immigration. And I don't see any sign that you can get more by asking for less, right? And furthermore, it's striking that people worry about backlash on immigration. I can't think of anything else they were they worry about backlash. I mean, I, I, I've never heard, say, someone who wants a strong national defense who says, sure, we want one, but if we try, if we defend the military too adamantly, it will make people resent us, and so we need to soft pedal this a bit, right? I've never known anyone who says we're really worried about discrimination, but if we complain too much, people won't like us, so let's moderate our complaints. Instead, the usual strategy almost everyone has is, the, like, you won't get all you want, but the more you ask for, the more you get. And I don't see much sign that they're wrong on that. Hmm. I guess, uh, the, Brian, here's the counterpoint. This is where I'm like totally unrealistic. And, and uh, I love the ideas. I think immigration makes us stronger. I don't mind, you know, when I run for office again someday. God, don't let my wife see this. <laughs> just, just kidding, honey. Um, you know, no, but I, you, having been in the arena and trying to get votes, if I were to say I'm the open borders candidate, it's over. So, you know, who's going to carry that message? I think, I think that's where I'm saying it's unrealistic. And what I want to try to convince policymakers of is some of the keyhole solutions, right? So I would sort of start there um, and, and saying, I actually don't like merit-based immigration as a principle because we've actually got a very successful policy based on family reunification. If our concern is security, for example, how do you minimize potential terrorists? You don't just wanna bring somebody in with a, a master's degree in engineering that then gets frustrated because he's not assimilating well. Maybe you get somebody who comes in that doesn't have a master's degree, but they have a family and they know where to open a bank account and how to get a job. And they're actually pretty smart and they start a company, right? So our entrepreneurial advantage did not come from recruiting merit-based. It came from bringing in refugees. And a lot of times those children of refugees go on to found companies. And like my friend, Franz Hong, serve at West Point, serve in the White House, and then found multiple companies and create lots of jobs. So let's be careful with our merit. But keyhole solutions, Brian, is all I'm really saying. I think you, you have a brilliant chapter on that. And let's then talk about what are the right keyhole solutions because we won't get a, we won't get a candidate to say, I'm for open borders. Right, I mean, just one thing. So if you actually are a politician, then what Tim is saying makes a lot more sense. Because we know that politicians aren't honest. Right, <laughs> right? And, and they can't be honest. If they were honest, they wouldn't be in power. Right, so of course, politicians can't say exactly what they think. They've got to tone things down, bend the truth. But that doesn't mean that advocates want to tone things down or bend the truth. Instead, they're the people that are giving politicians a sign about what they can get away with. So really, it's people like me that are making it possible for people like Tim to say anything good about immigration. And if it weren't for people like me around, then Tim might have to go and say something much worse. So, <laughs> right? And, um, and I, I will say, say, I mean, I think, I, think, you know, I think Tim would have done, perhaps done better if he weren't such an honest and wonderful guy. <laughs> but, uh, you know, that's the system, unfortunately. Yeah, I was going to say here, we have evidence of Brian's claim. We have an honest guy who lost as a politician. I, I sorry. So uh, now begins the Q&A portion of uh, the event. A uh, few rules about this. Uh, first, please wait to be called on. I will be doing the calling. Uh, please wait for the microphone so everyone in the room and our audience watching online can hear your question. Please identify yourself. And Cato is a libertarian think tank, but I will tightly regulate the Q&A. <laughs> that means ask a question and do it quickly, or I will have uh, start a regulatory intervention. <laughs> so, uh, questions, um, this gentleman right here in the middle, uh, right there, yeah, yeah. Hi, thanks for having this. Uh, Rafael Bernal from the Hill newspaper. Uh, on, on this argument of, uh, of, you make a lot of arguments as to what, how you would implement or why you would implement open borders, all the economic arguments, but the why seems to be a defense of, of the freedom of, of movement, like the individual freedom of movement, uh, an essentially liberal why. Uh, it seems that you would need liberals to start getting behind open borders to, uh, you know, to actually move that Overton window. 
how do you how do you propose going after liberals and convincing them that this is the way to go politically? Right. So, I mean, a lot of it for me is just trying to be really friendly with everyone. So I want to be really nice and friendly to liberals to get them on board. I want to be really nice and friendly to conservatives to make them think a second time. So I was just trying to really just bend over backwards just to talk to people like human beings. I think there's a, there's a lot of value in that. In terms of specifically targeting liberals, so I think you know, a lot of it is trying to make the economics palatable. So you know, there's people like Matt Iglesias who have gone and defended housing deregulation on liberal grounds, but a lot of what he's saying is just te textbook economics, which is repackaged to appeal to liberal audience. And again, I think a lot of what I would be doing there is just repackaging basic labor economics for a liberal audience. And just saying, look, you know, like, don't you want poor people to be able to get better jobs and have a better life? And aren't poor people in poor countries really you know, doing a lot worse than people that are already here? So, I mean, th there is that. I mean, of course, there's just, you know, listening to people and seeing, so like, what exactly, you know, why exactly is it that you don't want to do more? So, you know, I know, and, you know, and also finding common ground and saying, look, I know that liberals are very concerned about the treatment of the undocumented right now and dreamers and all, I'm, on, all, I'm all on board for that. And then, but if you know, that's so good, then why not let in just more people in the first place? Right, so I guess that's mo most of what I do. Um, you know, it's you know, never enough, but that's, that's where I'd start. Uh, in the back there in the white shirt, Uh, Ilya Soman, George Mason University. So uh, this is a question for Tim, though obviously Brian can weigh in as, as well. I agree with you. I think that it would be a, a political mistake for a candidate for office to run on open borders, but I'm not convinced that you're right, that the right way to frame this issue is, you know, does it make America better off, presumably meaning people already living in America, as opposed mm -hmm. to talking about the <coughs> rights of people uh, who could uh, potential migrants? Because if it doesn't seem to square, or maybe you can square it, but can you square it with the experience of previous successful <laughs> struggles to expand freedom and opportunity in new groups? If you look, for instance, at the history of the civil rights struggle, you had the Council of Economic Advisors, which pointed out entirely correctly, I think, that if you end Jim Crow segregation, blacks would be more productive and white people would benefit too. And then you had Martin Luther King saying, and others saying that, uh, people's rights uh, should depend on the content of their character, not the color of their skin, and appeal to inherent rights. I think it's pretty obvious which one of these was more successful in swaying public opinion. You can tell a similar story about the abolition of slavery, <coughs> the extension of rights to women, and so far and so forth. So why should this case be different, where suddenly in this case only appeals to the self-interest of the already dominant group? Uh, should be effective, whereas in every other case of success, it was done much more through appeals to the rights of the uh, out group than through persuading the in group that yeah. uh, this was in their narrow self interest. That sounds a great point. I, I would just, I'll try to be brief because there's so many great questions I can tell out there. Um, the uh, first of all, the difference is. The, in the civil rights movement, we're talking about both groups being citizens, whereas now immigrants are not citizens, although I think it's an open question. The power of technology, I'm a, I'm a fan of technology. I think Orwell was wrong that technology is a force for liberation, and when you see the images of, of any sort of mistreatment or poverty, one, I think that leads us as Americans to want to intervene and help in the world and stop genocide, which I think is a type of libertarianism that I know um, not everyone at Cato agrees with. But maybe also, I think you're right, it might, it might change the debate. Although I thought it was fascinating, Ilya, just as an open question, not as an answer. When there was the caravan, the migrant caravan coming and hitting throughout 2008, um, and, and images on the TV of these people from Central America coming and sort of expecting to be let in, and then there was the use of tear gas at the border that I thought both political parties sort of embraced that and said, see, we're right. And, and I'm not so sure the independent voter had sympathy. Like Nancy Pelosi was saying, they want to come in, we're, we're committing a war crime, and you had Republicans and people on Fox News saying, look, it literally is an invasion. The folks I talked to in central Ohio who were independent, it's not, about, it's not a race thing, they felt threatened to see people crashing the border. So those images cut both ways. I don't know ultimately where it settles. Next question. 
uh, gentleman in the black right there with the beard. <laughs> <laughs> so I have to keep narrowing it down. <laughs> uh, Adam Bates with the International Refugee Assistance Project, <laughs> formerly of Cato. Um, I'm, I'm curious about the, this idea of backlash and what you think that looks like. Uh, I mean, to me, isn't the backlash already here? Isn't it sitting in the White House right now? Um, wasn't it the Muslim ban and the refugee ban, the asylum bans? And we ended up here. Uh, George W. H. W. Bush and Ronald Reagan used to fight about who loved immigrants more. Yep. Now we have this uh, in the Republican Party, and that's without a robust advocacy for open borders, except from wacky libertarians and George Mason economists. So my, I guess my question is, how much worse can it get uh, just because people are pushing uh, for open borders? Well, I'm an optimistic guy, but believe me, it can get a lot worse. I mean, we're, we're oh, yeah. not even in a recession. You know, you, you, you think attitudes are bad now and we we're, we're have 3.5% unemployment rate? What when they go to 10%? It's very easy to scapegoat outside groups and we haven't even scratched the surface of it. And I think Trump's been, if you dare say, pretty moderate. He says pro-immigration things. He says anti-immigration things too. But it's, it'd be very easy to come up with candidates. And I think when the Democrats play the polarization game and, and they defended Obama saying, I'm gonna use my pen now because Congress isn't acting. It's the president's authority to just make immigration policy. I said, you guys better be careful because what if Donald Trump gets elected? And they just laughed. I was at public events, go look them up on the internet. Democrats laughed that Trump could get elected. Believe me, Trump's pretty even handed. The policy that came out of the CEA, I thought was, even though I don't like merit-based, I thought they had a pretty even handed policy. So I think it can get a lot worse and it will. It will get a lot worse when we have that next recession. Yeah, so I don't think Trump is even-handed, but the system of checks and balances stops him from doing what he wants. So, you know, he has not managed to change fundamental law on immigration at all, right? So everything that he does is by executive order, and when another person comes into the office, those executive orders can easily be changed and probably will be changed. So I was worried for a couple of years that he would manage to fundamentally change U.S. immigration law. He failed, and it just lost interest, and... I think you know, if he wins the next election, he'll be a lame duck and won't achieve anything there either. So I think we dodged a bullet on that, but it could have been worse. And I, I just say credit to Brian. The, the left has been falling into this argument of if you disagree with us, you're racist. That's not in this book at all. It's so even-handed. But so if, you're, if you want to argue for immigration, follow this playbook, not the they're racist playbook, because that, that'll polarize. That'll make the backlash worse. Uh, this gentleman right here in the second row. Uh, Richard Coleman, CBP, retired. Uh, turning the caravan into the scaravan, <laughs> the women and the children that terrorized the biggest military it ever created on the planet. Uh, here's my question. If there was data that showed that these people would vote Republican, wouldn't the argument change overnight? I don't think so. So, strangely, I don't think so, but here's the thing. Most Democrats don't want to just let in Democratic voters. Right? So you, you might think the Democrats would be pushing for open borders, saying, well, at least right now they're heavily Democratic, but it's a very unusual view. Bernie Sanders says this is a Koch brothers proposal. Mm -hmm. So I don't think that that would radically tip the scales. I think that you're right, though, at the margin it would make a difference. So yeah, Republicans have been more sympathetic towards Cuban immigrants, South Vietnamese immigrants. But it is surprising the extent to which neither party really does welcome people just with open arms. And I think it is, does come down to that original framing of thinking about immigration as charity and saying, look, we're not made of money. We can't just let everybody in. And I'm saying we can because they take care of themselves. Uh, how about the, this gentleman in the glasses in the third row? Thank you. Uh, Leo Kim, I work in biotech. Uh, Deanna, my wife, both of us are immigrants. Between two of us, uh, we probably went through a uh, like dozen different alphabet soup or visa, H1B, B1, B2, OPT, CR1, and we can go on and on. Question is, um, is there an effective open border advocacy regular immigrants like us can add from our own experience? And uh, my question comes from a place where we constantly are being asked to uh, jump the hoop, uh, 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 you know, go through an immigration Ironman uh, race the whole time. The most frustrating uh, occasion was of all was when 
uh, we needed to apply for a medical visa, and they certainly uh, failed to garner any uh, sympathy from immigration uh, system, the answer I got was wait. Right? So I made myself a little entertaining game to in engage in policy discussion with a USCIS customer service agent. <laughs> <laughs> um, and I say, oh, the, the medical treatment we are seeking is not available in our home country. Uh, why, why do you ask, ask us to wait? And they said, it's a system. And uh, I asked, what kind of system uh, makes us to wait? And it's a system that protects the country. And I go on that how come 20 something uh, uh, educated female uh, with US citizen husband with full medical insurance, means to afford uh, health care, everything uh, a good immigrants are supposed to have pose any national security, right? So this is one of many examples. So, so, is so there the any question, organization to... The question is, is there an organization that works on this currently, advocacy that you're aware of? Right. Well, of course, there is the Cato Institute. <laughs> uh, there's that. Uh, so, I mean, I have actually you know, talked to a lot of people involved in the effective altruism movement to see whether they have found some charity that demonstrably actually is delivering the goods, and th we're still looking. So that doesn't mean that none of the, that the groups that exist aren't doing a lot of good, but it's just that it hasn't really passed the gold standard of whether or not it's passing a cost-benefit test. Um, so you know, like, as soon as I find something, I'll definitely share it. Next question. Um, how about the fellow back there on the right-hand side in the blue sweater? Yes. Hi, Mario Lopez. How quickly you forget, Alex. <laughs> or can you not see me through the I can't see very well, I'm sorry. <laughs> all right, no worries. Um, thank you all for doing this. Uh, question on, uh, in terms of the book, um, you gave a spectacular uh, rundown. The two, it seems to me that two of the biggest arguments right now being proffered by restrictionists have to do with culture and crime. And I just wanted to know, um, other than the terrorist angle, which you talked about a little bit, um, there are, you know, of course, a lot of uh, faulty data on both of these uh, issues, and I just wondered if, to what extent they were dealt with in the book and what you might say about it. Yeah, so for crime, I'd say the data is now pretty good, so I go over that in the book, and the main punchline is in the U.S. It looks like foreign-born have about one-third lower crime rates than natives. Uh, for Europe, it seems like they're probably a bit higher, and I think there's a pretty simple story here, which is America has high crime rates, and the American natives have high crime rates, so immigrants are better than us. Uh, Europe, on the other hand, has low crime rates, so immigrants are worse than them. That's the s simple story there. Uh, but anyway, for the U.S., you know, like, look, looks uh, really good. In terms of culture, I go over a bunch of the social science literatures related to culture, so language is the really easy one where we can see that immigrants are doing fine. Talk about the uh, literature on trust and assimilation there, and go and then, you know talk about pre-assimilation. So. Overall, seems fine to me. It's, this is one of the areas where people, well, if you just say, look, I'm just worried about culture, but you don't give any specifics, it's really hard to know what people mean or to respond, right? So, I mean, like, you know, what's something Alex and I have talked about is there are many complaints about immigrants where when you look, you can't find any research on it. So it's like, well, then you have to do the research of the critics to, in order to find out what it is that they might be complaining about in the first place and then respond to it, which is tough and, of course, it's also a bit frustrating because people could always say you didn't do what we wanted. Like, well, why didn't you do what you wanted, mm -hmm. right? But mm -hmm. there it is. Yeah. All right, last question. Let's make it a critical one. <laughs> All right, that gentleman right there with the glasses, I see. Uh, wait for the microphone, please. Yes. I'm an immigrant. Um, there's one thing you have not mentioned, either of you, any of you, and that is climate change. Mm -hmm. Go forward 30 years, 25, 30 years, and Southeast Asia, Middle East, Africa is roiling in violence. Huge numbers of people are trying to get the hell out and maybe come here. Just think of it. What will your uh, views likely to be when this scenario occurs? Right. So, of course, when people are going to die or be admitted as refugees, then totally admit them. That uh, seems like not a problem. In terms of, you know, what I thought you were going to go is, yeah, well, let these immigrants in, they get a higher standard of living, then they pollute more, and then they make the problem worse. 
Uh, so there, there's something called the environmental Kuznets curve that says that when economic growth increases from extreme poverty, that you generally do get more pollution per person. But then when you get rich enough, then pollution starts going down. Right? So that's my, well, the main thing that I would say about the dangers of letting immigrants get a higher standard of living is that it is a way uh, is that you know eventually actually the problem does fix itself. And the other thing you know so but yeah but like but just in terms of letting in refugees then you know let them in so yes so you know, what would I say about letting in refugees I say let them in. Um, yeah. I don't think mm -hmm. in, a micro, in a microphone, please. Sorry. Right. Seriously enough, okay. Mm. The young people are trying to get your attention, okay, but you're not, uh, okay. generally speaking, right. being serious about okay. it. I don't. I don't right. think. I think that's an unfair claim. I don't think the book says one thing either way about climate change, and I don't think that means they're not taking it seriously. Yeah. There's. There's. So climate change is. is um, it's an open question. I can tell you, I have one colleague, George Schultz, who t talks about that particular issue, immigration-induced climate change. He takes it seriously. Bjorn Lomberg's another colleague at Hoover who says that even when it's real, and, and this has blown people's minds, the harm seem to be really exaggerated. And so I'm not so sure which of them is right, but I do know there's another long-term advantage, well, two. One is science is on our side, and the human animal will respond to a threat and I think they'll find ways to do engineering that absorbs some of the um, carbon out of the atmosphere. But two is demographics are on our side. I think people that are complaining right now about immigration will have a backlash, but I also think 30 years from now is a framework I use and we'll say, well, we need more immigrants. That's going to be the immigration dilemma because the birth rates are going down so dramatically and we're going to be weaker as a country and we'll recognize it. All the things that Brian points out, we need them for. I think a majority of Americans will recognize that. Anyway. Right, and what I say is, you know, like we can totally take millions of immigrants. We can take millions of refugees. We can do it easily. It's not a problem, and I think that's the wise approach. Well, uh, thank you, everybody, uh, today. The reception will be held in the Winter Garden, which is located in the lobby. Restrooms are located on this level, to the left of the elevators. Uh, please allow the speakers to exit the auditorium first, if you don't mind. They will be available at the reception to answer your questions. Uh, please ask them lots of questions. And uh, let's give them all a round of applause.